In my experience, I, I get to hang out with a lot of kingdom entrepreneurs every week, every month, every year. Um, and I get to kind of see what's going with the patterns and the trends. And it, it, you know, it astounds me, you know, as I, as I go around the country and beyond, I get to see people in two very distinct groups, right? You know, and, and it begs the question for me, why? Why can we have two people, um, you know, in, in the same market economy in a similar industry with the, with the similar amount of, you know, gifts, talents and, and things available, but they can produce very different results. And, um, you know, and as I've explored that concept, I've really come to realize that most of our success as a kingdom entrepreneur happens between the ears. And, uh, and I believe actually that, you know, the, if, if you're going to win in business, that win has to happen between the ears before it ever happens in the marketplace. You, you know, you will either win or lose in here uh, before you ever win or lose in the marketplace. So I just want to spend a bit of time on thinking and of course, you know, the Bible has an awful lot to say about thinking. Um, as a man thinketh, so is he. You know, basically, basically, you can't have an exterior world that is different to your interior world. Like, if you can't see it internally, you won't be able to have it externally. You know, the Bible says, whatever is a good report, think on those things. Um, and it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there's a lot that the Bible has to say about the mind, and, and there's just a couple. There's, uh, there's a whole lot more than that. I guess, um, you know, if we're going to be a supernatural thinker, then our thinking must line up with God's thinking. You know, I think that would make total sense for us to understand that, except that we live in a world where we are bombarded with messages all day, every day, uh, you know, Facebook, social, Instagram, friends, all these things, and yet very little of that thinking would be God's thinking. So um, that's why it's important to have these conversations. If we explore God's thinking for a second, what is it that God has always wanted? What has God always wanted for humanity right, from, right back in the very beginning? Well, you know, if we strip it all back, what he's wanted is a group of people like his, his children, but it's us choosing of our own volition to worship him and essentially establish his government on earth. Because when we do, we would have a wonderful place to live. So that's what he's always wanted. And so I guess, you know, then we have a part to play in that story. Um, and as business people, I guess, you know, we, we've got to kind of take that concept of, you know, that, that government and that culture that he's wanted on earth and, and play our part, which is to take that culture to the marketplace. And, um, and it's not a different set of rules. You know, mercy, mer mercy truth, um, grace, you know, kindness, you know, prosperity, they're all things that the Lord wants for his children, then, then they are the things that need to be reflected in the marketplace. Um, and yet, if you look around, you get to see the exact opposite of that. You know, you could grab the Australian today and look at the business section and you'll see hostile takeovers, you know, people crossing any moral boundary to produce a shareholder profit. You know, you know you'll see the overthrowing of a CEO. Like, you, you'll see the opposite of the very culture that God wants in the marketplace. So, it is our job um, to play a part, you know, in our business dealings, in our businesses, in our communities, to bring that culture out and show people an example of it. So that's a really big task, right, what I'm talking about here. And you've heard it from, from some other people as well. It's a big task for us to do. So I guess, um, so then I want to get to, okay, where does thinking play a part in this? And, um, and so I'm going to distill it down to this, right? I'm going to draw a little thing up on my flip chart here, hopefully it comes out. If, if we look at the journey of uh, a kingdom entrepreneur, if we look at the journey, right, like a, a timeline of events, there are essentially three, um, three stages to the journey. I'm gonna draw a line there and a line there, right? You know, we've got the launch of something, which happens in here, right? We've got the launch, and then we've got the success, all right, of, of whatever it is, and we've got that in here. I think the vast majority of people that I talk to can fully grasp, right? They get really excited about the launch of something, right? You know, like the, that, that exciting kind of dreaming it all up and getting it started and rallying the team or whatever, you know, the logo design and the website. And like, they get really excited about that. And some people can get really excited, like they can see the end game of what they're trying to build. The problem is is that 90% of the journey is in the middle, and that is just hard, plain work, right? 
And that is where our thinking often lets us down. I reckon this is where the game is won. This bit's easy and exciting. This bit's easy and exciting. This bit in the middle, far out. This is what separates the men from the boys. Uh, or, you know, or, or the, you know, the people that really, really want it and those that don't. So um, I, I kind of want to break it into three categories. Like how do we become a supernatural thinker that lasts <clears throat> the distance? One, point number one is you need to crystallize, crystallize the vision or the assignment that the Lord has for you in the marketplace. Okay, you need to get really clear, right, uh, on, 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 on what it is. Because the clearer you can distill down what it is you're going to do, right, the impact you're going to have, the size of organization, you know, the influence that you're going to have, the dollars you're going to give away, the churches, the, the organizations you're going to fund, the more you can crystallize what that impact is, the more that force will pull you through the long game in the middle. Okay? Now, people say, well, I don't know what my assignment is. Well, then make your assignment finding your assignment, right? Like it's, like it's not okay to not know what God's put inside of you to work out what he's got for you. Like, like you, the reason why you have a Holy Ghost is so that you can work these things out. You have direct communication. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. You go straight to him and say, Lord, what do you have for me? See, see I know and I knew from a week after coming to Christ that I was building a training academy for Christian entrepreneurs, you know, and ultimately raising up 10,000 business people to trade God's way and to, to change culture. Like, I know that. And I, could, and I could spend an entire day talking about the nuances of how that'll come about. Because the, the clearer it is for me, uh, you know, I almost feel like the, the spies that went to the promised land and came back, I've seen it. I've had a taste of it. Now we've got to do the hard work, you know, to, to occupy it. And so I say that because you need to actually spend time working out what that thing is or what those things are or what the outcome is from your life, um, you know, because he's put inside of you a whole bunch of skills and talents. You need to work out what they are and what he's got for you and do that. And, and the, more, the more nuances and clarity you can get around that vision and that assignment, the more it'll pull you through. Like if I think about the Apostle Paul just for a second, he knew from the very beginning that he was to take the gospel from, to Jew, Gentile, and king. Um, and ultimately, he knew that he had to take the gospel all the way to the center of Rome, to Caesar, because when, when, when Rome had the gospel, it would, it would completely destroy it. And of course, that's what he spent his life doing, was basically you know, moving into the center of Rome throughout his you know, entire, I guess, walk with the Lord. Um, and then, of course, you know, when he finally gets the gospel to the center of Rome, to Caesar, it dismantles it over the coming time. He had that really clear vision and he chased it down, right? So one, if to last the distance is you need to have a very clear vision. The second thing is you need to develop fortitude. And I think this is a bit of a lost art, to be honest, uh, you know, in the modern era is fortitude. Let's use another word. Let's say hunger, right? How do you develop such a hunger that nothing can stop you? How do you develop such a hunger that nothing can stop you? I've got some thoughts. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether you're a Rocky Balboa fan, um, but there's that scene in Rocky, a you know, famous scene where he says, it doesn't matter how many times you get hit, it matters how many times you get back up. And I think to myself, you know what, that's cool, it's true. But I actually think it's different to that. I actually think it's not about how many times you get hit. I think it's not about how many times you'll get back up because an entrepreneur, you'll keep getting up. I think the issue is how long you spend on the mat, I think is, you know, is the distinction between the good and the great, right? Everybody gets back up. It's just that some people hang out down there for far too long. That's what it's like in a boxing analogy. You take a business analogy, you know, you get ripped off, you lose money, you do a deal that's bad. So many people park there and wallow in their pity for three months, six months, 24 months, three years. Some people, they just park there. It's like that's time on the mat. You're wasting it. Once you've got that internal fortitude and that hunger, then you, you'll happily put up with the knocks and the hits and the setbacks because there's something inside of you that says nothing will put me off. And that's where we've got to get to if we want to be a supernatural thinker. So I guess how? How do we arrive at that? Here's where I got to uh, along that journey. I fast forward in my life 
um, to what, what Scripture says about the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, we're about to get really heavy just for a minute. Um, scripture tells us, or Paul tells us in Scripture, that when we die and, and, and we go to heaven, we are going to be seated in the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to be tested or judged. And, and please understand, this is not a judgment against sin or you know, your ability to level up or are you good enough. That was, that was paid for. That's why it's the best deal in the world. No, this is a judgment against the talents. Did you use the talents he put inside of you? You know, like, like we all have a certain grace and a certain ability and, 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 and differences that we need to bring to the table, right? It doesn't matter whether you look at Joseph, Joshua, Esther, Paul, they, like Gideon, they all had a natural DNA that they were able to use to achieve their assignment, and you do too. So you are going to be tested against whether you use those very gifts and talents he put inside of you. And so for me, now that I know that, that is what drives me. That, that, that's where my fortitude comes from. It comes from the fact that actually I'm going to have to give an account for today and tomorrow and the next day. And so I cannot afford when things happen that suck and don't go well and a coronavirus hits and all these things, I've got to get myself back up on the mat and keep going because I'm going to have to give an account for this. And I don't think it's going to be okay to stand before the creator of the universe and say, God, I couldn't actually do my assignment because, because a few people got a cold in 2020, all right? So it's not a shock to him. It shouldn't be a shock to me. And I've got an obligation to keep moving, right? So for me, this is where I got to. I got to the point where actually I'm going to give an account for this life. And that needs to bring me such gravity that I get up every day and I want to make the most of it. Listen, ultimately, you and I, if you're a redeemed believer, then you too laid down your life. If you laid down your life and you took up a life in Christ, you have no rights anyway to wallow in your own pity because you laid that stuff down when you came to Christ. So as you put on uh, the, you know, the, the new man, then, then you just keep moving forward in spite of circumstances. And let me tell you, this journey is so long and so hard that you need to get up and put one foot in front of the other every single day, regardless of what you face, because you're going to give an account. The third thing that I think that we have to master if we are going to uh, become a supernatural thinker and last the distance between the hard work is actually we need to handle disappointment. We actually need some tools to handle disappointment because it's going to come, right? Obviously, there's big disappointments like coronavirus, right? That's a big one because that takes out, you know, whatever, the most of a year and maybe more, who knows? And there's also the little ones, right? You know, you, you get a team member that you thought was good that ends up being terrible. You, one of your customers leave, your suppliers let you, like, like there's, there's no end to disappointment in business. And let me tell you that if you build a bigger business, the disappointments don't go away, okay? You actually end up with more of them and they're bigger. But at the same time, you get better at handling them so they don't derail you, um, but I think, I think we need some tools to be able to handle disappointments. And let me tell you, I worked this out the hard way. Um, you know, if I go back, I've been in business for most of my life. Uh, I'm 41 now and I started in business at 19, so a little bit over half. And, uh, you know, and I think back to those early years, I used to live on that massive roller coaster. You know, when I got an email to say, yes, we want to work with you, I was like riding high. And then I would get an email that says, you know, whatever, you, you owe the tax man some money, or then you get another email, that you get a great team member, then another team member's a gossip. And I used to ride these emotional highs, and, and let me tell you, <laughs> it sucks to live that life, right? It sucks to be, um, you know, to, to be basically, you know, at the, because you're kind of at the mercy of everybody else's outcomes and thoughts and emails and decisions, and, uh, and by the way, if that's how you are, you're not being the head, you're being the tail. So, so, so for me, I, I got so sick of, of either being, you know, shooting the lights out or, or having a pity party. I thought there's got to be a better place for me to sit in uh, emotionally. Um, and so here's where I arrived at. I basically just decided, and I, and I basically, I arrived at this by journaling and thinking this thing through. I'm like, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute hang on a minute. So I started to write down the left-hand side of my page all the things that were going wrong in my business life. 
all the disappointments, all the problems that I had. But then on the right-hand side, I wrote down all the things that were going well. And I realized that at any given time, there were lots of both. At any given time, I had problems that I had to deal with, but I also had a whole bunch of really good things, right? And, and I think it's important because here's what I arrived at. I arrived at the decision where I am totally okay that there is always bad things happening in my business and there's always good things happening in my business. And I kind of live just happy with the fact that there is both consistently all the time, okay? There is always things that are letting me down or annoying me or frustrating. There's always those. There's always those things that are going really, really well. And I am just happy with both because neither of them are going to go away. And what it does is it stops the highs and lows and helps me kind of sit in a nice balanced place, um, which actually just makes me better at handling the problems anyway, right? And so as I talk to a lot of people, though, I find that people fall in one of two categories. And it is usually, it is usually that they really only see and meditate on the things that are going wrong. Now, you have to understand the brain. The brain, um, you know, like, okay, so we're talking about the subconscious brain here, and we don't have time to go through all this. But if we talk about the subconscious brain, it doesn't know good, bad, right, and wrong. It just knows data. And so what happens is, if you're basically in that default mindset of when's the next bad thing going to happen to me, you will find it, right? And, And the same person can go through the same life And one brain just picks up on the fact that, you know, this customer's a gossiper and this one's bad and this team member's this and the economy's going bad and I can't. One sees all of that stuff, but you actually could just turn your brain on to start to see all the other stuff, right? The customer that you just won, the staff member that's doing a really good job, the new premises that are, you get to choose what your brain sees in any moment, right? And so that, you need to master you Because if you go through your life only seeing the negative, it will derail you, you'll have burnout, and you'll quit. If you go through your life at least seeing the good, because there's tons of it, um, then of course it's gonna it's gonna spur you on, you know, it's gonna win. But ultimately, you just need to be okay with the fact that there is always good going in your business, there is always bad stuff going on in your business, and that right there is entrepreneurship. If you can sit in that space, then you will have the tools to last. The longest part of the game, which is the bit that we're calling hard work. Hard work. Hey, I've got something for you. Um, Just while I remember, and maybe Pat can put the URL into the chat. Uh, I produced a seven-day devotional, right? I just took seven big topics from scripture and and taught them uh, into video, and you can have those. uh, Pat's just put it up there. If you go to businessgreenhouse.com.au forward slash devotionals, Completely free. You don't have to pay anything. We will just email you a devotional every day for seven days, um, me teaching. So if you like what I'm talking about now, you'll like that stuff. If you don't like what I'm talking about now, you'll really like that stuff. I'm going to run through three incorrect thoughts that kingdom entrepreneurs usually have. Number one, and this is, this is just round. I just kind of picked what are the conversations I hear that are incorrect. Here's number one. Entrepreneurs thinking if I hold back some of my giving, I will be able to keep the money, invest it, compound it, and give more money later. Let me tell you, that's a mistake. Um, you know, there might be other reasons why you would want to hold back your giving, but that one is a mistake. Uh, you know, because, because that's worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is spend your whole life making loads of money and then give it away at the end of your life. That's worldly wisdom. Kingdom wis- wisdom is when the Lord says, test me in this. Start giving away when it doesn't make sense, and then you have to rely on the provision of the Lord to prosper you, okay? You need to start giving early, and you start need to giving sacrificially, and you may think you're losing, and you are. That's when heaven needs to come in and provide your opportunities and your multiplication and all those kind of things, right? So, so do not put off your giving until a later date. That is a massive mistake. The second kind of thinking that I think is a mistake is people that say, I don't want to strive. I'm, I don't want to do it in my own strength. And so they use that as a um, kind of like couching their not so strong work ethic. 
Let me tell you, I have not met a successful kingdom entrepreneur, men or women, who hasn't needed to go into the marketplace and work very, very, very hard. Big mornings, big days, big nights sometimes. And yes, it's a very hard juggle when you've got to look after your health and your family and you walk with the Lord. But you need to work incredibly hard. Proverbs says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms and poverty will come on you like a bandit. Listen, you, you, work is worship. It's the same word in scripture. The word work and the word worship is the same word. It's the word avoda, A-V-O-D-A-H. All right? When you work hard and diligently, actually that's a sign to the Lord that you're respecting the assignment and you're prepared to chase it down. So don't worry about striving. The Lord will show you when you are pushing too hard. Between now and then, just work. Do the work. The third thinking that I think you uh, need to maybe consider is what I see a lot of Christians make as a mistake, and that is that they think they have to be kind, um, kind to everybody. And they think that by being kind, they're actually showing God. I actually, uh, I actually think that it's a potentially a mistake, okay? Because I see, as a concept, it makes sense that we should be kind. The outworking that I see where the mistake is is that it makes some people, you know, they're scared of confrontation. They'll keep staff, right? They, they, won't, they, won't, they won't negotiate with suppliers. They'll push them around, right? They, they just think they need to be kind with everybody. And so in doing so, the enemy just smashes them and just keeps them playing small. I want to say to you that, you know, you, you can communicate in love, but you need to be clear, right? Because I, I think to be unclear is to be unkind, so you just need to be clear in your communication. It's okay to go to your team members who are underperforming and say, hey, team member, what you're doing is not okay and I need you to lift your standard to here. It's okay to have that conversation. It's okay to sack someone. You know, it's, it's a new thing. It's just been released. You can sack someone now and still go to heaven, right? So it's okay. It's permissible. So you, you actually will be taken advantage of if you want to go around being kind and nice to everybody. You need to be clear and assertive. Remember, you're a royal priesthood, right? A chosen people. You're the head and not the tail. We don't bully anybody. We want them to win. But I see a lot of people that err on the side of kindness. And what happens is they just get taken out by everybody else's agenda. Okay? It's okay to go back to your supplier and say, you've done the wrong thing and I need a better rate. It's okay to go to your landlord and say, I need a better rate than this. It's okay to, you know, whatever you need to do, negotiate, push back and drive your business forward. You can do all of that in love. But if you just have this worldview of I need to be kind and nice, then you will definitely be the tail rather than the no sleep, no rest, might crash, might, but first I stretch, tell them run it all.